People in Gaza are very resilient and they have been through airstrikes and wars and occupations and siege and blockade, disengagement. They've been through so much that when something like this happens, they know how to cope with it in the first instant. When it happened, where were you and where were your kids? Uh, my kids was in school. It's uh, beside uh, a police uh, center. And I, I met this incredible woman called Rima who really made an impact on me because she was so normal. She was such a lovely woman and she had this spirit in her where she was just trying to protect her children. And I thought, I think what I thought was that she reminded me of my mother. What would you like people outside in the world to understand about what you're going through? What we feel. They have to understand what we feel. And what do you feel? I'm saved. I'm going to die any minute. Any minute. And leave my kids alone. Mm -hmm. You know, they feel this too. They feel mom will go, we want to die. Mom, we want to die with you. We, we want to die with you. Not don't die. We want to die with you. They not, not to have. <laughs> what did we do? Nothing. Nothing. And I thought, pe people may not be able to identify with a Palestinian, or somebody living in Gaza, or somebody who was a refugee, or somebody Arab, but everyone can identify with a mother. That's a kind of fear that everyone can relate to because everyone who has a child can understand what it's like to want to protect. She was so honest with what she said. And I remember the first time that I was really, really affected and had a hard time with one of my reports was that first one I did with Rima. She told me that her little, uh, her, her son Asil, who's six years old, she told me Asil has a real problem in that he just will not leave her alone. So I turned to him and I said, you know, Asili, why don't you leave your mum alone? Because I thought I was going to get that perfect you know, sound bite where Asili was going to tell me it's because I'm really scared and the bombs are outside. And he said, I'm not afraid, but I just want to make sure that when my mum dies, I'm going to die with her. And he's six years old. We are happy family with a great big and a gift from me to you. Won't you say you love me too? So the death toll increasing now to 428, and the number uh, of casualties over 2,100, according to hospital officials here, Emran. We had seen what a week of aerial and naval bombardment had done to Gaza. And to imagine that now this was going to be followed by a ground offensive uh, meant that there was just going to be more killing, more destruction, more death. Uh, and for me, it was very alarming. It was something that you know, I was just very, you know, very worried about as a person, as a journalist, but also very worried about um, you know, for the well-being of uh, all of the Gazans uh, that we work with and all of the people, you know, that we know here, what that was going to mean for them. The most terrifying day for me was the morning of the ground invasion. And I remember calling the Israeli army and giving them our coordinates for maybe the tenth time. And they said, we can't guarantee your safety because if there are Hamas fighters in your building or if they come in, we will hit it. 
So we effectively were in the same situation as one and a half million Palestinians. So on a personal level, the ground invasion was a new height of fear for me. We suddenly got a sense that troops were moving towards us, that there really was nowhere to go or nowhere to run anymore, that the battle was intensifying to a level that we couldn't foresee anymore, we couldn't guess, we couldn't analyze what was going to happen next. Unfortunately, as you can see from the smoke rising there, uh, in fact, the UN buildings are indeed uh, coming under fire either directly or indirectly. When those initial reports came in that at least 40 people had been killed, uh, and there were immediate mixed reports about who was killed, where did the shells land, did they land in the school. The Israeli military quickly came out and said that there were Palestinians firing rockets from the area and that the military was simply returning fire uh, in that direction. The following morning, we decided to go and see exactly for ourselves. Lying in peace amidst the war, as mourners pray for the victims of what many are calling an Israeli massacre. Killed when Israeli shells landed near the UN school that hoped would protect them. Instead, their shelter became their death trap. Now, the United Nations is calling for an international investigation. The Fahura school was the third makeshift UN shelter attacked since Israel began its war on Gaza. We ask everyone love, love to live in freedom and we ask freedom itself. We want security. The following day, the United Nations, or at least perhaps later that day, the United Nations confirmed that the Israeli military told them, in fact, they were wrong. No Palestinian factions were firing rockets from there and that they would be launching an investigation into that particular incident. <laughs> Well, in Gaza's market, people have come out. It's been extremely busy in these few hours of relative quiet. You can see uh, people are selling food right from the back of their trucks. Time is definitely of the essence, and they're certainly limited on that before Israel begins its bombardment again. They're trying to get their hands on everything, including uh, candles. Electricity has been cut throughout uh, the entire Gaza Strip, and uh, 1.5 million people have been left in the dark. So it is a bit uh, chaotic here in the market as people try to get their hands on whatever uh, is being sold. Everyone is complaining, though, that there's no electricity, no clean running water, and that has made the situation for them very difficult. Uh, at the end of the day, they are concerned, though, because in about uh, 45 minutes' time, the ceasefire will end. A lot of these people told us they will be heading back home, and the uncertainty of life will once again uh, grip them as it has been for the past 12 days. Psychologically, it was an important break because, you know, there was no let up in this war. We saw firsthand the kind of uh, relief that the people were experiencing, but it was relief that was really coupled with anxiety that they weren't going to have enough time. <laughs> By the second day, the humanitarian corridor, you know, proved to be anything but. Attacks continued. Uh, the timing of these so-called humanitarian quarters shifted from day to day, and so people couldn't find a rhythm of life to kind of get into. We were reporting from the military when these so-called windows were going to take place. So again, it ended up being more of a psychological tool against the people than it was a few hours of respite. <laughs> he gave his life to save another. 38-year-old Arafah died while on duty. He was a volunteer ambulance driver. And in this war, he was also a victim of what Israel calls 
its targeted strikes. This is the ambulance he was driving when an Israeli missile hit. A crew went back to film it days later and came under attack by Israeli forces. The man who was driving the ambulance when Arafat was killed went to pay his respects to his family and five children. And even while we were there, sound of a missile. With the land invasion, you had a different type of story. The airstrikes were terrorizing, but the land invasion, that effectively split Gaza, that got Israeli troops were now once again on Gaza soil. And it's a different kind of fear that people describe. There's the one kind of fear of the bombs that you can hear and that you can see outside your window. It's a different kind of fear when you see the tanks rolling in, when you see the shelling, the artillery shelling, houses next to you and houses nearby in your own house. And you can actually see the Israeli soldiers and then you unable to leave your house and run anymore. And that is when the real atrocities began. <laughs> 